This is the Open University. Mr. Mary, lecturer in his happy place, uh, Paris. I spend half the month in Paris, and I'm here just now in the uh, apartment of my girlfriend in the 12th arrondissement, uh, which happens to be very handy for the eye hospital. A lot of blind people with canes and sunglasses and all the rest of it. And this last weekend, I was one of them. I was actually in the eye hospital, um, in the urgence department, the uh, um, accidents and emergency department. Um, seeking attention for my good eye, my one remaining good eye, because I'm blind in this eye. And it made me realize that um, I've never talked about my eye problems. I seem to have a wonderful life. I do. I'm, I'm living my best life, as they say. Um, but the, the major misfortune, the one sort of misfortune I have had in my life is this um, crisis, which happened almost exactly 20 years ago in, um, well, actually 22 years ago, in late 1997. Um, it began with a fairly innocuous um, rash on my right eye. I was touring um, in Greece uh, with Tug. We'd been playing a concert there, and um, I'd driven all the way, actually rented a car in Paris and drove all the way to Greece and back. And um, So this was November 1997. Uh, I woke up in um, the 13th arrondissement of Paris, where Tug's girlfriend had a flat at the time, and noticed that I had this red, looked like conjunctivitis, a sort of rash around the eye or an inflammation of the eyelid. I'd always had, when I was a kid, I had little sort of inflamed eyelids quite often and uh, it didn't really seem to portend anything serious. But um, when I got back to London, I did, you know, conscientiously go to the Moorfields Eye Hospital to get them to look at it. And um, again, I was living in London at that time on Long Lane, just by the Barbican Estate, which uh, was pretty handy for Moorfields Eye Hospital. Moorfields, where David Bowie spent a lot of his time um, when he had his uh, fight with George Underwood, got punched in the eye and um, uh, had one of his uh, pupils fully extended um, the whole time, uh, it stuck in that extended position. I think he was par partly blind in that, that other eye, I'm not sure. Uh, Accounts vary, but um, anyway, it was one of the many parallels between my life and David Bowie's life that I, I basically had a two-year period in which I was going in because because when I uh, turned up for this, uh, what I thought was a fairly routine checkup, they they said, well, listen, you've got a very serious condition which um, we're seeing a lot more of these days as a result of contact lenses, and it's um it's called a kind of amoeba keratitis. And apparently, I, the way I've worked it out is that um, this, uh, these amoebas, which are fairly present in water, tap water and other kinds of water everywhere, had infected my lens container, my lens case. Uh, and because uh, I'd washed it in the cabin in, on the ship between Greece and Italy, we went from Piraeus to Bari, and it was an overnight trip on the ferry. So uh, I had a cabin and washed this container with dubious water uh, and then must have nicked the surface of the, the eye with um, the cornea with um, the lens as it came out, which happens quite a lot and is normally fairly innocuous, but uh, in this case must have infected the eye itself with these amoebas, account amoebas, which, uh, as I say, are fairly common. So um, they then <coughs> set up their little colonies, their little cities, their high-density uh, uh, communities on the surface of my eye and once they get in there they're very hard to get out so Moorfields told me A that this is potentially blinding and B that uh, the, there isn't really a cure for it <clears throat> they didn't at that time and I, as far as I know they still don't now have an effective way to get this out you just have to put a lot of eye drops in all the time and hope that the um, the amoebas are sort of zapped eventually um, in my case, that didn't happen, and um, I, I rather foolishly uh, prioritized touring America, trying to break America. This was my major project at the time. I was doing annual tours of the U.S., um, college, the college circuit in the U.S., trying to make moments big in, in at least the college circuit of America. And um, that seemed pretty important to my career. And I, so the eye thing was kind of a side issue for me. I didn't really 
think it was going to be as devastating as it turned out to be. I certainly didn't expect to go blind from it. Um, and, and so every, every year during this two-year period of intensive treatment, I would go off and tour the U.S. So I remember, I guess, I guess it didn't take long for the eye to, to start to sort of mist over. And um, so I woke up on my birthday in Atlanta, Georgia, my, my 38th birthday, 1998, February the 11th, and suddenly couldn't see through the, eye, the right eye anymore um, I'd been given lots of drops in which I had to keep cool in thermos flasks to to drop into my eyes during the tour. The eye hospital didn't recommend that I go off to America, but they said, well, if you do, for God's sake, just keep putting these drops in. And I had three different droppers, and they all had to be kept cool, and so I dropped them in. And I was getting photophobic as well, like my eyes were starting to react badly to the light. I think I was on steroids. They put me on steroids and um, a thing called cyclosporin, which is an immune system suppressant which I think I was probably on after I had a corneal graft, because this thing of the eye frosting over, I could sort of see light through it, but I couldn't see any detail at all. It was just like looking through a, a, an opaque um, but translucent pane of glass. So that was obviously pretty disturbing. And I remember I'd been with uh, Tug and his girlfriend and Matt Jacobson, who was touring us around, um, to a thrift store in Georgia, and we'd got some interesting clothes, like a bright yellow tracksuit and stuff like that. And we were having a sort of fashion show back at our accommodation, and um, <clears throat> it was very smoky. I think two uh, was heavily smoking at the time, and uh, I, I'm sure that didn't help, being in this very smoky environment. So when I went to bed that night, I felt really sick, and then when I woke up the next morning, I had this this thing of my my eye um, not seeing anymore. And um, <clears throat> I guess I started wearing eye patches. I just sort of, <laughs> just sort of thought, this is not a, a big deal. I'm going to just, you know, put that eye behind scaffolding and um, uh, tarpaulin, and uh, get on with my life. So um, I did that. And and when I got back to London, the next question became, you know, your, we have to give you a, um, a cataract operation because your um, your cornea has gone. Uh, um, Bad, but then later that corneal, uh, that cataract operation, I don't know, something the, the the cornea was getting stretched thin and then perforated. So that's possibly the most scared I've ever been was when I went into the um, Moorfields and my eye consultant, Mr. Larkin, looked at looked through the usual ophthalmological instruments and said, um, "I'm afraid that's perforated. What's in your stomach?" <laughs> <laughs> that's the most terrifying sentence I've ever heard in my life. What's in your stomach? Because it means they're going to operate. If there's nothing in your stomach, they're going to operate right away. This was a Friday, um, and the alternative date for the operation would be Monday. So in the end, well, I had just eaten, so I said, well, listen, my dinner's in my stomach. I can't be operated on. So he said, okay, Monday we're going to do this operation, which is a corneal graft operation. Because if you get a, a perforated cornea, your eye is basically open to the weather, and to any kind of infection, and uh, that's very bad. Your eyes connect to your brain, you really don't want that to happen. So you need at least, whatever else is going on in the eye, and all sorts of veins are probably growing across the optic nerve, and you know, unpleasant stuff is happening in a sick eye. But you do need, at the very minimum, to keep the front window sealed against the weather. So um, I had this operation. I really just remember being terrified that weekend, and going to see a... a um, uh, it wasn't Sasha Waltz, it was, uh, what was her name, um, from Wuppertal, the choreographer from Wuppertal, um, uh, uh, who did Café Muller. I went to see Café Muller at the Barbican, and I, w I was unable to concentrate on the dance at all. I just um, was terrified about this upcoming operation, which happened under general anaesthetic. I mean, the biopsies had been bad enough. There was a series of biopsies where they basically have to take a piece of the material of the sick organ and test it. So that involved being just under local anaesthetic, having uh, your bits of your eye chopped out. So you'd be lying under a very bright light with your surgeon above you saying, well, uh, this isn't going to take very long. We just need a little tiny bit of the flesh of the eye, you know, the, the cornea or whatever, um, from the corner of your eye to, to test what's going on. And that hurt like hell. To have a knife stuck into your eye while you're fully conscious, only slightly anaesthetized with local drops, uh, was terrifying. So I had the reputation of not being a very courageous patient, um, being terribly sensitive. So they put me under general anaesthetic for the corneal graft operation. That was successful. It, the donor was apparently a woman who'd been killed in a traffic accident in Plymouth or somewhere like that, <clears throat> which I find interesting. You're not really supposed to know who your donor is, but um, 
she, uh, I guess I read my patient notes and uh, I was asked to carry them from one office to another and I went into the bathroom and read them on the way. Um, so I have, I am a transsexual in some ways, you know, I have bits of a woman's body, an actual woman's body in my body now. This graft is still there and it's, it's worked for 20 years. So thank you to that um, deceased woman, whoever she was. And... Um, but this didn't save the vision in the eye. There were all sorts of complications, and eventually the eye went blind. In a sense, it was worse when it was partially sighted because I was getting double vision. And, and you know, if I didn't cover it up with an eye patch, I was seeing two lots of information. And it began to swivel out of shape and everything, and it looked bad. And So in a way, I very quickly just resigned myself to, to the eye patches. And I kind of liked how the eye patches made me look. They were quite dramatic and people think you're a pirate and that's quite glamorous in some ways. It's funny, when I was in Southeast Asia a couple of years ago, people were saying, uh, everywhere I went, uh, the sort of young bucks were, 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 were whispering or shouting, Jespero, Jespero. And I thought, wow, there must be a one-eyed character in uh, Myanmar culture called Jespero. But I realized they were actually saying Jack Sparrow, the pirate who's in Pirates of the Caribbean, which I hadn't seen, but, you know just shows you that you know you sort of underestimate the global influence of Hollywood. But um, yeah, I didn't mind becoming Jespero, um, uh, along with being Momus. It gave Momus more of a visual identity. And I'm, I'm weirdly kind of un, 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 uh, affected by technical malfunctions, really. I, just, I never kind of wept at the loss of my, my sight. Uh, it just seemed like a hassle. I objected more to the medicalization of being on steroids, which really changed my personality and made me short-tempered and aggressive and um, made me feel like my body was pumped up all the time. And then these, uh, the cyclosporin, which made me very hairy. I had suddenly like Mr. Hyde-like eyebrows and things. And uh, So I didn't like that drug, chemical manipulation at all. And I was very relieved to, after a couple of years, when they finally said, listen, you've just gone blind, I'm sorry. It was actually a BBC documentary about um, five years after all these troubles about parasites, uh, which included a section about me in which they interviewed my eye consultant, Mr. Larkin, and he sort of pretended to be consoling me as if we were just having our final meeting in the hospital, and he sort of patted me on the, the back and said, I'm sorry, this is a much worse outcome than we usually it's have. Regrettable. <laughs> I think I'm probably the worst outcome uh, in Britain of this particular thing. And of course, you know, some people would have a class action against Johnson & Johnson, um, AccuView lenses, <laughs> whatever. Uh, the thing I always tell people is don't um, store your lenses. Use one-day disposables if you do have to use contact lenses. I've been using them since the late 80s, and they were kind of, you know, liberating for 10 years or so, and then suddenly they claimed one of my eyes. So be very careful with lenses. But... Um, there was very, really very little um, long-lasting effect. I got more interested in flatness and in pictorial representations of the world. I got really into digital photography because I was seeing the world flat. That was one effect of, of having just one eye. Um, and occasionally I would get headaches because I do still have the eye in there. They, did, they offered um, <laughs> another of these terrifying phrases um, <clears throat> is... Um, uh, I, I want to say excoriation, but it's not excoriation. It's um, the word for uh, uh, terminating the dead eye and replacing it with the prosthesis. But I never had that done. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so one effect is that the eye is in there and it's very responsive. It's quite low pressure. It's like a sort of burst grape or something. And it's responsive to weather uh, alterations, low pressure systems high altitudes. If I go up a mountain in Switzerland or if I'm on a plane on a long-haul flight, I am at risk of getting a bit of a, a headache, a migraine. And I get these migraines, I have to just lie down for several hours, up to 12 hours, you know, maybe once a month or once every couple of months I get one of these things. Which is not fun, but, you know, it's sort of when you, when you come out, when you pull out of that, it's actually really great to come back to life and feel, feel good again. But um, I've always taken for granted that I, I have one good eye you know, which wasn't affected. And so in a sense, it wasn't the worst possible outcome because I only got this in one eye, um, despite having contact lenses in the same case, which were on both eyes, you know. So um, I suppose that I never really contemplated the nightmare scenario of something happening to the other eye until just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Berlin. I was taking a selfie, <laughs> somebody on 
on Facebook said, God moves in mysterious ways. This was some kind of punishment. But I was taking a selfie. Um, I bought some new sweaters in Humana and this new jacket, actually. And I um, was quite pleased with how they looked. So um, I'd also bought some new slippers which had felt soles and which were very, very slippery. And I'm skating about, you know, um, happily on my uh, wooden floors. But um, then I sort of forgot that I, after the initial reaction of, God, these are incredibly slippery slippers, I'd forgotten that. And then I, so when I was running to get into position for this selfie, I, I just went, bam, I slipped and, uh, you know, I was running and then couldn't, couldn't right myself and even couldn't put up my arms to save my face. So I just, my face went bang against the floor. And uh, I was just stunned, and I just lay there still for a few seconds, thinking, shit, am I going to be dead now, <laughs> or what? And there was blood. I could sense that my tooth had, you know, punctured my lip a bit. And um, uh, initially, I didn't have a black eye or anything. But in, over the days that followed, I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't very painful. A little bit of bruising on my face. And um, over the days that followed, I started to get a black eye, rather delayed reaction, uh, which is only now just going away. You can still see traces of it. And, um, but I, I kind of thought really nothing more of that. And I, in fact, I continued taking the selfies, <laughs> even with blood pouring out of my face. I thought, wow, this is going to look cool. That's the way I think, you know. And um, then I came to Paris uh, the end of last week and um, ha was ha in the middle of a very nice weekend. Uh, when on Saturday evening, I started noticing uh, that I had sparkles. I could see sparkles around the periphery of my vision. Uh, and there wasn't actual light. It was a kind of illusory light. Um, and I, I, it, it's something I've never had before. Uh, and I looked up the internet and it said, this can be the symptom of a detached retina, which is a very serious condition, potentially blinding. Um, and if you don't get it treated within 48 hours, you know, it's a surgically treated as well, a physical operation to put the cornea back, uh, to put the... Um, retina back together, uh, you can go blind. So that really scared me because obviously to be looking at the possibility of losing two eyes, I mean, you know, total blindness. Just imagine I've got, what, 30 years, <laughs> if I'm lucky, 30 years left, something like that. Imagine being totally blind for 30 years. My girlfriend was super supportive and she was like, I'll look after you, you know. We're having all these visions of a miserable future, where, like a Samuel Beckett play, where I'm a totally blind man and I'm being led around and having the world described to me by my girlfriend. Um, Tuke's brother, actually, is totally blind. Um, so he literally has done that. He's taken his brother on holiday and described what he's seeing to him. Um, he, being a poet, you know, is particularly adept at that. Um, but um, one doesn't want to, you know, romantic though that, that vision might be with one's girlfriend, uh, one doesn't really want to impose that on anyone. So uh, we, we thought we have to get down to the eye hospital as soon as possible. We did that. We went along and um, I was uh, prioritized. Uh, there were about 25 people in there late on a Saturday evening. And um, the consultant, uh, Shauna, well, first of all, she just did a, a basic test and then um, sent me back to the waiting room and brought me in again. Shone some very bright lights and had a video camera actually resting against the uh, white of the eye. And uh, this was so bright and so unbearable for me that I sneezed suddenly and she got furious because I was sneezing all over the equipment and all over her face and everything. So she ran off to scrub down, came back. And we had to do this test three times because I found it so difficult to, to hold still with this. It was like staring into the sun, you know. And it reminded me of all the misery that I'd gone through in the eye hospital. I mean, there were really moments. I was actually hospitalized, you know, given a room in, the, in Moorfields for a while. And um, the consultant, I had to put eye drops in at every hour during the night. So I had to either wake myself up or be woken up by the nurses to drop, put these drops in. And I opted to do this myself. But the consultant came in and said, listen, we're, I hear you're not doing this every hour on the hour, you know, and... It was just really weird. It was like being back at boarding school and feeling you had no authority over your own life. You were being given a, a dressing down by the teacher or something. It was just a really horrible situation. And the fact that your sleep was being interrupted, it was like a kind of torture situation, almost like a physical um, uh, disorientation so that you would confess or something like that. But, um, yeah, so, about, so I was having flashbacks to all the original nightmarish stuff. Um, and in the end, the, the um, consultant here in... Uh, Harris just said, listen, this is fine. It's actually what we call a vitreous detachment. It's not a retinal detachment. So it's not serious. There's no treatment in particular. It just goes away of its own accord. And in fact, the symptoms of the sparkling I was seeing 
went away while I was in the waiting room at the hospital. And it's still, I've seen a little, little bit of it, but it's really gone away. Thank goodness. So, touch wood, um, no serious outcome this time. I've got away with it. Um, but <clears throat> it really brought home to me how important it is to have at least one functioning eye. And it reminded me of that whole story, and it made me think, well, I haven't told you guys uh, one of the most dramatic things. I mean, obviously, it's in my book, um, which is called Enfance by Nathalie Savo. No, it's not. It's, uh, it's called Niche by Marmus. And uh, that's the, the main thing I've been doing this week, is going through the uh, going through 3,000 3, edits um, on the book. You always think you're on the final round of edits, and then there's another round. So I guess we have the legal edits after this. I've, I've gone through with a lawyer in New York, the uh, uh, changing everybody's names and that kind of thing, and trying to avoid lawsuits and you know all that stuff, indemnifying the company that's putting it out, Forest Trust and Giroux. So um, we'll have to pull those into shape next. And uh, so the, the publication date is July 2020, um, and um, it'll be a, a, a relief. <laughs> To, to finish all that work, but um, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted, and, and obviously the episode is described in there, but I wanted to describe it to you in my own inimitable way. Outside on the square, they're now starting, we have the market here every day on the Place d'Alicle, and they're starting to um, to mop up with their uh, noisy uh, cleaning equipment, so I'm going to end it here, and um, I wish you all the best from a rather grey and wet Paris, uh, which nevertheless is my happy place. Oh, I do want to say, I want to end, since we're in a political season in Britain, I want to end by saying all that treatment I got at, at Moorfields Hospital in London was on the NHS. The NHS is currently more under threat than it's ever been with Tories dealing, even even now, doing, doing deals with, um, uh, uh, with Trump's American um, capitalist cronies to break up the NHS and make it what the U.S. health system is, which is the most inefficient and the most expensive health system in the world with terrible outcomes in terms of um, health. <laughs> America rates very, very badly. And the, the ratio of, of money they spend to the um, outcomes they get is, is just appalling in the U.S. We do not want that in Britain. Please do not vote Tory. I'm sure nobody who watches these videos is going to vote Tory, but, you know, vote any party except Tory and potentially... Um, Lib Dem, but even you know, tactically, maybe there are cases where it makes sense to vote. You know, you don't need me to tell you this. I can't vote. I, I don't have any address in the UK. Um, I will be enormously affected by the outcome for my citizenship as well. But uh, we all need the NHS in the end. And uh, please do everything you can to keep it. Open University.